Perfect. Let's get started. Thanks everybody for coming. Welcome to uh, welcome to the board meeting, and uh, hopefully we all uh, are around for LPC after. If you can't get enough league exposure, then there's something wrong. There's something there. wrong, right? Yep. 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 Uh, there thanks. Are, there are snacks in the back. Anybody we need to introduce that uh, that we haven't seen before at our at our meetings? Anybody? My name is John. Pike. This is Mayor Pike <laughs> of St. George, Utah. Anybody else? I think we're all I think we're all friends here. Okay, let's uh, let's get on to item two: the review and approval of the minutes. Has anybody had a chance to look over the minutes? And I do. Have any? And I have just a couple of little like typos that I can't help but pick up on when I'm here early and have a few minutes. So, Perfect. so page three, bottom of the page, it says new revenue is modes. I think it means modest. Yes. It's under tax task force. So I think it's modest. Yes. Going down a little farther. So page four, under the second uh, open bullet, new tax on fuel. Does that should that say no tax on fuel except diesel? I'm not sure if that one matters too much because that was just no commentary. That is new. It's but it's but even that it's probably not the right term. It's, it's additional additional sales tax, right, Roger? Yes, it's additional type of sales tax. But okay, probably doesn't matter too much. Uh, down a little bit further, um, one, two, three paragraphs down. Board member Niehaus, that one. His uh, second um, sentence is economic development bigger than the FID for rural Utah. I don't know if that's. I'm no. I'm not sure what FID is supposed to be, but I don't think it's FID. See <laughs> that there. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I'll talk to Annette and see okay. exactly. Uh, well, you know, that's why Annette's not here. Yes, so um, Annette was planning on coming today, and she uh, usually takes our minutes. Um, her mother-in-law is in hospice right now, so she uh, and her husband are, are there, so won't be joining us today. I promise you more, but on the bullets, just below the third one, wait and study more. It says and. Not a big deal, but. When did you get here? And I did this on my phone, you know, because I didn't have next hard copy yet. Next page, um, page five, uh, one, two, three paragraphs down. Board member Erin Mendenhall, that one. She wanted us all to know what a pillar to have been a member of this association. I'm guessing pleasure. Pleasure. Okay. And then down just a little farther under the open bullets, uh, Director Deal suggested we could do the following written questionnaire, is my guess, is what that's supposed to say. And that is all I have. Otherwise, I would make a motion to include the minutes with those corrections. If you'll entertain one correction, I noticed oh. starting in the minutes, Mayor Mendenhall. Oh, uh, yeah. Are you a mayor? No, I see that. I, I had a pretty good joke. But if I'm sandwiched between two mayors, I'm not going to make that joke <laughs> about council members and mayors, right, Don? Right. Yeah. I, I think you should make it. You think I should make it? It had something to do with, you know, who, who just is a pretty face and who does the work. <laughs> <in cities. laughs> I won't make that but joke. In the, but in this case, you wouldn't have been correct. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'd... Uh, uh, motion and uh, with those corrections, do we have a second for the minutes? I'll second as amended. Okay, Mayor Beerman, second in the minutes. All in favor say aye. 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 Passes. Perfect. Uh, let's move on. Uh, number three conflict of interest disclosure. Uh, any disclosure with uh, anything on the agenda today that uh, people would have a conflict of interest about? If we could let it known, be known. Don't see any hands shooting up. Perfect. Uh, number four, the board commission reports and appointments. It looks like Abby Bollock is up on that one. 
Yes, so for that board, we have, um, we need to have two people start from the link. So we received, you'll see in your board packet, um, an application from Mark Kiptrell, I believe his name is, from Salt Lake City, who is the senior city attorney there. We also received another application from Heather Schreiber. She is from Orem. Um, so we are also, the Attorneys Association is looking for some more applicants as well. So we're going to see if they submit any more, um, and then once they send us, if they found someone else, then we'll submit to the governor's office. So that's kind of where we're at there. We have those two, and we're waiting for a couple more. And like I said, Heather's application came in this morning. Okay. Not okay. So I have a copy if anyone wants to see her. Um, application, that is kind of our update there. Did you say we have uh, two spots to fill and mm -hmm. we have we two have, So we have two spots, one, one of which needs to be filled. And the governor requires that we send at least two for every vacancy. Oh, okay. So now we have two with Mark and Heather for that vacancy and the Municipal Attorneys Association has done some outreach. So our request to the board is to approve those two with the caveat that the Attorneys Association may give us some more names this week, in which case we would bring those names to the officers for confirmation or for endorsement before we send it to the um, governor's office. They can be appointed in January. Perfect. Anybody know any reason? I didn't see Mark's application in the packet. It's his No, we've kept the just the memo in the packet. Okay. okay. Yeah, sorry. I think send that to you. Maybe when we have them all, it'd be useful to look at them side by side. But for now, um, Cameron, do we need a motion for those mm -hmm. two? We do need a motion of either an endorsement of those two, or if people want to see the actual applications, we can send those out and essentially have a motion to authorize the officers to make the endorsement. Uh, but we do want to get the endorsements to the governor's office by the end of the month so that they can go through the process in January. I'll make that motion to endorse. Okay. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. And then Nick, online, I think everybody said aye. Yes. How many do we have online with us, Nick? Looks like we've had a few more join. So we've got... Nine. Perfect. Okay. All right. Uh, gets us to number five, presentation of the fiscal year 2019 uh, annual audit. Uh, I.D. Bailey and Associates. We call you Associates, just the Sorry, accounting I firm. Pay you <laughs> yes. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Cameron, are you leading out on this, or we're just letting you nope. go at it? We'll let, we'll let them take the lead. Nick, do you want to introduce them? Yep. So we have, uh, from I Bailey, we've got Michael Mickelson and Travis Vadness, uh, who we've worked with, and uh, they, were, they had some of their associates working at our office um, over the last few months to go through our audit. Abby and I worked really closely with them in person. Uh, Dave Sanderson um, and Carrie Nakamura also uh, worked with them as we uh, sorted out this audit. And I, with that, I will turn it over to them. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And present the results of our audit. Uh, you've probably heard this presentation before or similar presentations, so uh, I'll try to be as brief as I can, but I do want to remind the board about the inherent limitations in an audit. Our audit standards require that we obtain sufficient evidence to provide reasonable assurance, but not absolute assurance. When we do that, we uh, begin by gaining an understanding of internal controls, related to the different audit areas and financial statement cycles and things. We establish materiality threshold and we assess risk. So as we look at all those different audit areas, an area that might have a higher risk and a higher materiality is an area we're going to spend more time in than an area that has a lower materiality and a lower risk. And so that's how we divide up the time that we have to spend uh, in the areas where we sample, because you can't look at 100% of the transactions. Uh, 
an area that has a larger materiality and a higher risk will end up with a larger sample size than an area with less materiality and uh, assessment. After we uh, do all that, then we design our audit procedures and perform those procedures and gather our audit evidence to determine our auditor's opinion. The auditor's opinion that uh, we plan to issue this year is an unmodified opinion. So it's the opinion that provides that reasonable assurance that the financial statements are fairly stated in all material respects in relation to generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, so so we're, we're happy to do that. Uh, I know that we've had conversations the past two or three years about <coughs> adverse opinions and modifications to our opinions related to the old component units. Those have sufficiently fallen off. They're in the past uh, with the work that was done. <laughs> <laughs> we have a toast or anything? <laughs> but we, we don't have to modify our report for those anymore. So, uh, I'm not gonna go into the background, but the, 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 there were two component units uh, that was difficult to get some information on in order to audit in a pynon. So uh, they've been terminated sufficiently long that none of the old information would come into this audit period. So they have fallen off. There are some other uh, additional information in, in our auditor's report that is not a report modification. Uh, after our opinion, there are three additional paragraphs uh, relating to some uh, required supplementary information. Uh, the Governmental Accounting Standards Board requires management's discussion and analysis to accompany financial statements, and then there are also some pension-related schedules that follow the footnotes that are required by GASB, and that's required supplementary information that we don't opine on. That belongs to management, and uh, we don't opine on that. Uh, there is a supplemental schedule, a statement of revenues and expenses, and, uh, compared with budget uh, that also uh, follows the footnotes. That's considered other information as opposed to required supplementary information, we, uh, it's not required part of the financial statements. So we don't uh, offer an opinion on that either. And then the final paragraph ref refers to our report under government auditing standards. Uh, the government accountability office at the federal level has established this set of government accounting or auditing standards rather that, uh, Anytime there's a single audit done, it has to be done under government auditing standards. You don't have a single audit, but the state of Utah has required by statute that any government in the state that has a financial statement audit must have that audit done under this additional set of standards. And so we've issued another report in accordance with government auditing standards. Uh, and that paragraph in our auditor's report on page two just refers to that so financial statement readers know that there's an additional report that they should read as they consider the results of our audit. Uh, I've asked Travis today to go over that government auditing standards report and the state compliance report that are both at the back of the financial statement packet. And then I will finish up by talking about an additional letter that we issue and a couple of the things in that letter that may be of interest. So, Travis. All right, so to go along with what Mike was talking about, starting on page 31 of the financial statements, there is a government auditing standards uh, report that Mike was talking about. Um, keep in mind, all three of these reports are all un unmodified. So there's a green check mark, you guys passed. So we did not have any findings on the government auditing standards report. Um, whereas in prior years, there, there were findings, I believe, but we'll get into that on another page. So the government auditing standards report is an unmodified report to go along with the independent auditor's report. We also need to prepare a state compliance report. This report is required when you, by the state, there are certain levels that you need to have the state compliance audit performed. And we performed, this starts on page 33, and we performed five tests on five different compliance areas. 
So one of them we have to test every three years, and I believe that is the uh, is it the public treasurer's bond, but that's, or is it the fund balance? But that's every year. There, there's two chapters in this guide, one that we have to test every year and one where we test every three. The items that we have to test every three were tested last year. Oh, so we didn't so have to do so we didn't much. have to do any of the every okay. three this year. And so the five items that they're all on the annual test. And they're always going to be tested. Yep. Um, and through our testing of the compliance, everything came up clean. We didn't find any findings this year in related to any of those compliance requirements. So uh, good job there. So we also have issued an unmodified opinion on the state compliance report. Then the last page, page 35, is our schedule of findings and responses. So this will be the last time that you really see anything related to the, the two companies. But this is saying current year findings for the financial statements, there was none. We didn't have any. And then the prior year findings are talking about that gap departure for those two. That was last year's finding. It wasn't this year's. This is saying it was last year's and it wasn't a finding this year. So related to that finding, it is gone. You won't be seeing that next year. Government auditing standards requires follow-up on prior findings so that you're aware of the remediation that took place. And that has been remediated, as I said earlier. So that's the only reason it's there is for the follow-up. In addition to those three auditors' reports, uh, we issue another letter under auditing standards uh, when there's a board such as yours that's charged with governance of the entity. Do you have that? Now? I do. Okay. Very good. I'm not going to go through the whole letter. Uh, it's fairly boilerplate and standard, uh, and we've issued it in the past. There are a couple things that I do want to talk about, though. The financial statements do consist of a number of estimates. Uh, not every number in the financial statements is exact. Uh, things like pre the amortization of prepaid insurance or depreciation of property and equipment, capital assets, for example, those are estimates. Those aren't very subjective. Those are pretty easy to calculate. So, but we're required to communicate to you the estimates that we think are significant. And in our opinion, those are the ones that are more subjective and maybe more difficult to determine. And so the estimate in the financial statements that we would like to communicate as being significant to you is the net pension liability. Now, management uh, isn't very involved in calculating that. Management provides uh, payroll information to the Utah Retirement Systems, and Utah Retirement Systems hires an actuary to determine that Are others having a difficult time hearing? Yeah, I think maybe they muted us. Yes. Yeah, I, I've I lost them too. I sent a message to them that we couldn't hear them. Thank you. Uh, can you hear us now? Yes. Yep. Yes. 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 About that? We get the hint. <laughs> <laughs> The one other item out of this letter uh, I would like to talk about is we did have some audit adjustments as a result of our audit procedures. And we want to go through those with the board. And we're required to communicate those to you. Two of them were below our materiality threshold and we could have passed on. Management determined that they wanted to have them posted anyway. I believe management wants everything as accurate as they can get it for you. And so those were posted. 
uh, on page two of the letter, the second and third bullet point detail those. Uh, the URS benefit obligation was overstated a little bit because there had been some cafeteria wages included in what was reported to Utah Retirement, and those wages shouldn't have been. Uh, that's been corrected, I believe, with Utah Retirement and in the, the contributions going forward. And uh, I, so I believe there is a, re a receivable booked for that, that you'll receive some of that back. Yes. So those inappropriate, or for those contributions, excess contributions you made calculated on those cafeteria wages. And then there was a, a credit card payable. Uh, I think the statements closed in mid uh, June, and then there were some transactions subsequent uh, between the middle of June and the end of June that hadn't been reported. Uh, that were not material, and those were recorded. The uh, bigger one is the first one. There was a city that paid its membership dues and then realized they didn't have to pay them yet because they're billed April-ish uh, for the following fiscal year, and they're technically not due until the beginning of the next fiscal year, but several governments just pay those when they receive the invoice, and, and they're deferred or unearned revenue until the fiscal year that they're for. This city decided that they wanted to hold on to the cash until they had to pay it, and so there was a refund uh, remitted. Instead of the debit for that refund reducing revenue or unearned revenue, it, it went against expense. And so there was an adjustment just to uh, take it out of expense and reduce the deferred revenue, uh, unearned revenue for that. Uh, Can I add one, one thing there? We are pretty confident, yeah. Let's just add one thing there. You know, it is common when we send the invoice after you approve the dues at the mid-year conference, that's when we send the invoices. So in this case, it was Salt Lake City. They paid a pot receipt, but it was still part of the previous fiscal year. So then they contacted us, and we refunded the money to them, and then they paid after July 1. But we just wanted to make sure everybody was clear about why a pretty sizable number was going, coming in and out. That was why, and it was Salt Lake City who has paid their membership dues for this year. Thank you. And anytime we have an audit adjustment like that, we have to consider that as a potential breakdown in internal control. And we've already communicated that we didn't have any findings or any control weaknesses. Uh, one thing that happened in the organization during the fiscal year was the transition from Sage to QuickBooks. And through that process, and I assume Nick's already walked you through that and talked to you about some of the complications and things that they went through and the work that they've done to correct all that, uh, we were able to see all the corrections that uh, Nick and David Sanderson have made all the work that they did in that transition, the, the types of problems that they had, and we feel that it wasn't necessarily a breakdown in internal control as much as it was some of these problems related to the transition. So we feel that it's pretty isolated, that the organization has sufficient internal controls in place, that if it weren't coupled with the transition from Sage to QuickBooks, the controls probably would have caught this. And so we have not reported it as a internal control weakness to you. But we are required to communicate to you audit adjustments. And so we're talking about it only in terms of an audit adjustment, not in terms of control weakness, because of those other considerations that we feel are in place there. So those are the points that I wanted to pull out of this uh, other letter and board communication to you. So are there any questions for us that we can answer to you? So the the pension liability went up significantly. Um, I haven't seen that in some of the other statements. Is that just recent? Well, we didn't, the state didn't earn as much on their funds as they thought they were going to? Or is there something else going on? Uh, it, if it went up here, it should have gone up significantly in all the others uh, because the, that total liability is calculated at that level and allocated based on contributions to all the governments. I know that uh, a year ago they changed their assumption for the discount rate and lowered that, and I believe that in the most recent financial statement, you're right, they did have uh, lower income than what was expected because it was for 
you know, the year from January 1st, 18 through December of 18, that's coming into these statements now. And that, as you recall, is a year where the returns were lower in the stock market. So there were some lower returns there. Other questions? Okay, well, in terms of issuing, we ask for a rep letter from management that formalizes some of the representations they made to us during the audit. We received that Friday afternoon, and uh, we're ready to issue our financial statements with the date of December 9th, uh, just like the draft that you have, and uh, we can do that after this meeting, assuming everything's okay with you. So, Perfect. Great. Thank you to Nick and team. They were, they were absolutely fantastic. They got us everything we wanted timely and answered any questions. And uh, it was a little bit more difficult for Nick because he had a new member added. So uh, thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. time that better, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all know who sets the standard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Need some training there. When's yeah. that training? <laughs> Michael Travis, thank you so much for awesome. your help. And uh, 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 before a motion, just again, thank you to everybody past and present, especially past that, uh, that have got to, to this stage uh, with the league. That's a, a lot of work. That's a lot of meetings. But uh, that is uh, great news all around to, to hear such a good report. So thank you so much. Welcome. We're happy to be Ready for a motion. So as I... As I do that, I uh, want to thank the auditors as well and, and staff again, um, Mike. Um, um, I think this is what we as officers and members expect, and this has been uh, quite a season of, um, as several of us in the room uh, are aware of, and others, all the, the fun and pain, uh, but uh, I, I just want to compliment our interim director, our current executive director, um, and Nick and the other staff that worked with him to make this happen. Uh, it's the software changes. Uh, appreciate the auditors recognizing that nuance uh, with this, this current fiscal year. Uh, and it's, it is incredible, I think, how much has um, changed and improved. There has been a ton in the last three Three years, not four, three, three, three years. <laughs> it's important making that happen, including um, past uh, elected officials who were, um, you know, from uh, Lynn Pace to uh, Steve that helped uh, wade through that with Roger and Cameron. So thank you, everybody, and I'll make the motion that we. Um, accept, uh, is that right, and approve the annual audit as has been presented by, um, let's say it, Hyde and Bailey? Hyde Bailey. Hyde Bailey. Thank you. Second. Motion by Mayor Pike and uh, a second by Jewel. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Perfect. We have approved the annual audit. Thanks again. Appreciate the good work. Thank you. We'll go ahead and get that prepared mission. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Have a good day. Great. That takes us to uh, to number six: uh, adv advocacy, engagement, and outreach update. And can I just say before I hand this over to Cameron, you can see the stuff that's on your table here. Uh, that uh, uh, I, I appreciate Susan and, and everybody that. Uh, goes into the, the work of, of this material. It's always uh, good to have something that uh, looks nice but reads well as well and gets straight to the point of summary to be able to get that to uh, uh, legislators uh, but, uh, but also the media uh, when, uh, when needed as well. So uh, appreciate all the, the good hard work that goes into this stuff. It, it looks really well. Looks really good. Reads really well. Go. Cameron. All right. <clears throat> thank you, President, and thank you for approving the audit. Uh, the only other thing I'll, I'll add to it is, for those of you who are relatively new to the board, 
the audit and related conversations, the audit used to take uh, entire board meetings, hours upon hours, and you were able to approve this most recent not here in less than 20 minutes. And that's, I'm still kind of in shock over here. Uh, so thank you for your support of the organization, and thank you to our financial team, Nick, Abby, Carrie, Dave, and others uh, for all of their work. We also to carry on to what the president just referenced with this legislative advocacy 101 document this year was the first time that we as a ledge team did not put the document together ourselves instead we relied on Susan's expertise of how to better communicate our key concepts and principles and that's been part of the overall strategic shift that this board has helped us try to um, try to achieve a you know, better cross-pollination internally of using Susan and her communication expertise with Ledge Team. Uh, the term that often we've been using in-house has been to de and mm -hmm. and I think that this document has, has helped on that path to try to de uh, the type of advocacy we provide. We were in this building on Saturday with over 100 of your new colleagues, uh, mayors and council members who were recently elected, and we did our best to try to de uh, everything that's coming at them we have another training scheduled for January 4th with Utah State University where we'll be broadcasting to locations around the state and we'll have league staff at each location around the state. Um, so the quick report I have from that meeting is there's a lot of excitement, a lot of energy. We had many people approach us one-on-one -on -one and say, how do I get involved in the league? I have these concerns. I have these policy priorities. How do I how do I engage with my fellow cities? So the, the energy was really exciting to behold uh, from, from Saturday. And that's in a day that it was snowing as everyone was driving here and we started at 8 a.m. And there was still energy and excitement. So with that being said, uh, I want to give an update on Amicus and also give, just give a, an overview of where I expect the next two Amicus requests to come from for the league. Uh, we have an amicus subgroup, for those who are new on the board, that consists of several board members, Mayor Silvestrini, who's on the call, Mayor John Christensen, who's on the call, and Mayor Miley Wilson-Edwards, who's on the call. In addition to those three elected officials, Dave Church, Roger, and I are on the amicus subgroup as well. You as a board approved a process a few months ago for the first time to have official league amicus briefs. Uh, we've already received two requests in those subsequent months. We rejected one because it didn't meet the criteria. The other one you approved in September and we accepted. And ultimately what we did is we uh, gave our stamp of approval to the amicus uh, brief that Layton City and West Jordan City provided based on the facts that we gave you at that September board meeting. <clears throat> I want to focus my comments though on the two issues that are coming and see if there are any just general questions or thoughts about them. Um, because both of them have major political ramifications. First is the transportation utility fee litigation that's coming out of Pleasant Grove that really started in Provo City. Uh, Mayor Kafusi had another commitment today and notified us that she was unable to come, but this is a big deal for Provo City, even though Pleasant Grove is the named party in the lawsuit. There are 11 cities around the state that have imposed what are known as transportation utility fees. And these fees started in Provo City about a decade ago under Mayor Curtis, and Provo continues to use them. It is a local user fee for transportation. And those 11 cities have all approached it a little bit differently. Most of the 11 cities are the size of Pleasant Grove as opposed to larger cities. Uh, Provo is the biggest. Uh, the Libertas Institute sued Pleasant Grove when they adopted their user fee. We were anticipating a decision in October. The judge ultimately recused himself, so now we're expecting a decision in January. We've had several legislators who told us they want to run legislation around the transportation utility fee. But they've offered that as a way to support cities to implement it. At the crux of this litigation is one simple question. Is the transportation utility fee a fee, which means the cities have the authority to impose it? without legislative authorization, or is it a tax? And if it's a tax, then we don't have the authority to impose it without legislative authorization. Pleasant Grove thus did not ask for our help in the um, filing at the district court level, but they have notified us that they would ask for an amicus brief if and when it goes to appeal. January is also when the legislative session will begin. 
So to try to be more proactive, uh, we have we are convening the group in a couple of days of those cities that have the utility fee, so we can get a better understanding of how each city has done it. So we. Okay. We lost it again. Yes. Does anybody have to be aware of this? Audio drop. We're back on. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, how far are we going? Uh, it had just dropped. So it just dropped. Okay. Well, if anybody on online has any clarifying questions, just ask, and I'm happy to repeat it. So when Governor Weigott uh, drove through Ogden City, the road user charging her car would automatically say, you know, the amount that you would pay for using the state infrastructure versus the local infrastructure, county or city. And then as you drove into North Salt Lake, the RV would probably ask for all meetings to be held here rather than in Salt Lake City, because the road user charge would track it here in North Salt Lake. That's the long-term goal. The pilot program starts in January just for that small universe of cars. But in our dialogue with legislators, when we said you've created this sex option uh, in tax reform, we said we want a local ability to generate revenue for transportation like the transportation utility fee. We want you to partner with us on that tool and leadership did not say no. So we have this kind of combination of events right now. You have tax reform and the discussions around transportation related to tax reform. You have the litigation in Pleasant Grove, which likely will have a decision in January just as the legislature is getting underway. And you have uh, 11, 10 other cities, including Provo, that have imposed that utility fee. And regardless of what that decision is, is going to generate some interest from legislators. So my purpose in bringing it up to you today was just to give you that overview of how all these pieces come together so that if and when in January our subgroup is asked for an amicus brief, you'll recognize that that amicus brief is part of a larger context around the transportation utility. Okay. Roger? Just a question. We'll have a trial court decision. Yes, trial court. And, and in truth, that's not the decision. So. No. That, what that decision will do will trigger whether or not the loser appeals and whether or not the legislature gets involved. And, and, and I think it's also worth noting, you know, the cities, in my opinion, are in a slightly different status than others. Uh, I think Provo has a very different argument. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you, you, the, 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 the court go a lot of different ways. I think regardless of the outcome, win or lose, you can see some uniformity develop out of this. Because the legislature has not been particularly hostile to us at all. Mm -hmm. But I think the idea that everybody does their own thing is not going to happen. Yeah, I, I think you're right. It, it smells a lot like impact fees from the 90s. Uh, and I, I'm going to have to defer to you and Hiskey and those of you who are, who are doing this in the 90s. Who are alive. But in that case, cities were imposing impact fees under your inherent fee authority. The fees vary widely by jurisdiction. The Supreme Court held, uh, upheld the ability of cities to impose impact fees. And the legislature said, okay, fine, we're going to come in and set some guidelines on impact fees. Meg is my land use expert. Is that a good enough summation of how the impact fees statute came about? Yeah. 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 So we wanted to just make you aware of all those pieces around the transportation utility fees, the litigation, and potential legislation. There is no bill file open at this point, but this is one that you can have a bill file open in a hurry, which is why we're convening that group of cities on Wednesday. So are there any questions around that advocacy issue? So as a long, <clears throat> Joel Allen Grant, so the long-term um, option for cities, it, you, you're, are you finding the trend is that we shouldn't go this way as a city? I mean, we shouldn't even look at doing something similar. Obviously, you have 10 cities doing it, right? 
when Provo did it, and I guess let me take a step back to answer that question. On, I'll do it for America Fusi. When Provo posted about a decade ago, and this is why Roger says Provo is unique. The majority of the land in Provo City is tax exempt. They have two temple LDS temples. They have the Missionary Training Center. They have BYU. They have all the county facilities. Yada yada yada. A lot of city facilities. This was seen as an option for them to impose a fee on all of the uh, different users in the city, and they ultimately struck an, an agreement with um, Inter Intermountain Healthcare, uh, the LDS Church, BYU, and others to impose that fee. Interestingly, some of those big stakeholders told the league that if other cities went down this path, they would fight it, uh, but they recognized that Provo was unique. Since then, 10 other cities and smaller communities, Pleasant View, Pleasant Grove, other cities that don't start with P, they've, they've also imposed the transportation utility fee, and it has not raised the ire yet of the legislature, with one exception. That was last year, Senator Deidre Henderson ran a bill um, at the request of Utah County because the county commission didn't like the fact that Provo was charging them a fee. And I guess this was two years ago. And so we were able to narrowly tailor that bill so it wouldn't have consequences everywhere else. I think it's not a matter of number, city number 12 or city number 20. I think it's a matter of when Salt Lake City, St. George, Ogden, bigger cities are interested in using that tool, then you'll see the IR of the legislature. Or if five more cities the size of Park City or Plymouth or Perry, I'm just going down my beads here. Um, <laughs> if, if, when they all impose the transportation utility fee, at some point, you'll see these other stakeholders saying, wait a minute. The litigation is it comes back to that question of tax versus fee. And we've heard legislators who have used that same language and said, you yeah, know, we like the tool, but call it a tax. And we said, it's not a tax, it's a fee. So if you like the tool, let it be a fee. Uh, and those are the things that we have to work out, which to make point about impact fees could get politically bloody, uh, which is why we're trying to get in front of it. We were hoping that we'd have a decision in October, so we'd have a few months to figure it out between then and the session. But now, uh, Pleasant Grove notified us uh, recently that they thought the decision could come in January, and of course that's that's problematic timing. The other thing is, is the Provo, other unique is the power city. The premise of being a utility road charge, those cities that run their own power companies have, a, have an additional leg to stand on. Thanks for that background. Yep, you're welcome. Online, are there any questions about that issue? <coughs> okay. The second potential amicus brief that also could come our way in January revolves around the inland port. Uh, for those of you who uh, did, were not on the board a couple of years ago, let me give a two-minute overview of the lead involvement in the Inland Port. In the spring of 2018, the legislature passed in a rather bizarre fashion the final version of the Inland Port Bill. Uh, it, it passed in about the 30 minutes after some uh, closed-door negotiations at 10.30 at night, uh, and uh, we, watched, we watched it go down in the most bizarre things we've ever seen. It was the second to last night of the session. On the last night of the session, I was at Salt Lake City Hall talking to their elected officials, including Mayor-elect uh, Mendenhall, also on the phone with our officers, including um, Councilmember Mendenhall and, and Mayor Pike. Um, last night of the session, there was a potential effort to pull the bill back. Ultimately, the bill passed. Uh, the Friday after the session, we submitted a veto request letter based on two underlying principles uh, within that version of the Inland Port Bill. One was the state revoking the land use authority of Salt Lake City over a quarter of their city mass. The second was around the state capturing the property tax revenue from a quarter of the city's land mass. It was all under the Ripper Clause, which is the constitutional provision that says the, sit, the state cannot delegate municipal authorities uh, 
to itself, that there are certain municipal authorities that are inherent with cities and towns. The state also cannot perform municipal functions. So that was, this, that was March of 2018. Over the next couple of months, um, Mayor Biskupski was negotiating with Governor Herbert, uh, who was supportive of those negotiations, but not directly involved. And then on the Saturday morning before the interim of the May interim, those negotiations fell apart. We, we were then contacted by the governor's office in frustration because they thought they were trying to bring people together to fix the bill. And um, fast forward a couple of weeks after that, the governor's office started negotiation, negotiating with the Salt Lake City Council office and the mayor's office did not participate in those negotiations. And the council office kept us as league staff appraised of all of the different drafts. We could provide comments. And then as officers, we reviewed the draft with them and ultimately submitted a letter a letter of support for the July special session bill in 2018. And the language in that special session letter referred to that bill as a significant improvement over the March bill. Um, on a somewhat humorous note, we got that bill, we got that letter signed by the officers that Monday morning. There was a press conference at 10 a.m. I raced to the Capitol with hard copies of it. They were waiting to start the press conference until I arrived with the letters. I handed a letter to Mike Maurer yeah. All he did was look at the back page where we said that we supported it as a significant improvement, said great, ran into the governor's office, and then they all came out, had their press conference, and announced that the league was on board. It was a really fascinating process to watch. Um, that, that special session legislation um, then led to additional legislation this past spring that's known as the Hub and Spoke model that allows for inland port satellites around the state. We initially opposed that bill because it was, it was undermining local authority. The legislature fixed it in large part because of the efforts of then Salt Lake City Council Chair Charlie Luke. Uh, he went to bat on behalf of other cities so that they wanted to have the same issues that Salt Lake City had had. Well, ultimately we, we, uh, we ended up dropping our opposition to the bill because the legislature responded to that request from the Salt Lake City Council. Uh, long story long, Salt Lake City still elected to sue over the inland port under that special session language, and still for good reason. The bill was a significant improvement, but some of those underlying questions about the Ripper Clause still existed. That, uh, the oral arguments have concluded at the trial court level, and the judge told Salt Lake City that he intended to have a decision in December or January. So again, from a political perspective, the session will kick off in January, and uh, both mayoral candidates, and particularly now Mayor Lake Mendenhall, informed the league that they intended to continue the lawsuit and ask for uh, amicable support from the league over the lawsuit. So again, I wanted to just bring that forward to you as general background of all the different issues and politics at play. I mentioned that Council Member Luke had gone to bat on behalf of all cities, he lost his re-election bid, and he, his replacement was at our training on Saturday, and I chatted with him and, and introduced myself and the league to him. But the first question he asked me is, where's the league on the inland port? The, the mayor elect uh, was on a, I don't think she's on the phone. She was going to try, but, but we she is. No, I'm here. I'm here. The mayor elect, do you want to uh, say anything uh, from your perspective? No, I think, I think you did a great and um, only slightly painful uh, reiteration of the Inland Port Saga. You're, you did a good job, Cameron. And I think the underlying ripper cause, uh, ripper issue, clause issue for Salt Lake City still pertains to every other city. That 100% um, ability to sweep future tax increment from 18,000 acres from our city and the ability that they have to appoint a three-member um, appellate committee of whoever they want from the Inland Port Authority to override certain land use decisions in Salt Lake City is a threat that is, is real for every city. Um, so anyway, our litigation continues and we do expect and hope for a decision uh, in the next, perhaps by the end of the year, but not uh, necessarily. So we'll see where that goes. I think ultimately when it comes to state 
legislation in this upcoming session, um, we, we prepare to roll ahead uh, regardless of the outcome of the litigation. Any questions for either the mayor elect or for me or any of the members of the amicus brief subcommittee? Okay. Oh. Right. Oh, I'm not actually conducting the meeting. So right. Go ahead, Mayor. <laughs> just, sure. just wondering on those, are, are those the two key issues then? Um, the Ripper Clause, you called it, mm -hmm. and what was the other one? So the yeah. Ripper Clause is the old issue and yes. property tax and land use authority are under the Ripper Clause. There are yeah. Business in Utah state history around the Ripper Clause, local land use, and property tax. There have only been a handful of cases about the Ripper Clause, period. Most of those have revolved around compensation or other unrelated things. And the court, probably two thirds of the time, has upheld the state action, but they have also upheld the local governments about a third of the time. The Ripper Clause. Now I'm going to start to sound like Dave Church here for a moment. Oh, no. Yeah. The Ripper Clause is not unique to Utah. It's in the state constitutions of close to 30 states. It was a progressive era um, insertion, and it was actually designed nationwide to put a check on corporate power and corporate interests, particularly the railroads. Uh, we have not done any research around the Ripper Clause in other states, but I have asked other state league directors how often they have seen litigation around the Ripper Clause. But the two issues at play here, property tax and land use authority, you don't get more clear cut in municipal function than are the one source of tax revenue that we control and land use authority. Raj? If I might, I think that you said, the central issue is taking a local government power, municipal power, and giving it to a special body. Yes. And I mean, it's a legend. I think, I think for Christmas we need to uh, get this removed. Can we file an amicus brief? No, because it was still at the trial court level. So, what's allows us to file amicus briefs at the Supreme Court or in certain circumstances the appellate court? And we, we, we created a program that was very narrow in scope so that we could say no to a variety of, or, you know, every type of off the shelf issue that comes our way. Uh, the one that we rejected thus far came from UDOT. And we said, unless it's a city bringing it, we won't, we won't engage. But these, the two, these two issues, I wanted to give you the background now before we're in the middle of a request so that you would understand all the ramifications around it. So now that the audio is back, Roger, will you- uh, I was going to say the, the, the central issue with the Ripper Clause is delegation to a special commission. And it's this three person entity that was created to do this. And, and so that's part of the question. The other is, is, is there a statewide purpose that's involved? There's a lot of deference given the statewide purpose, <laughs> except land use has sort of always been viewed as the a local property tax has been viewed as a local government role. So it is a, it is a very legitimate issue. In my understanding from reports of the case, the judges, you, both sides argue very, very legitimate issues. Mm -hmm. But it is not a, it's not a stalling issue. It's a very real question here because the, the issue is, could you just go create these bodies and then sort of say, fine, we'll, we'll let these guys run your show. Yeah, it's really, the whole premise of it's really quite incredible and concerning. Yeah. <clears throat> and especially with the hub and spoke, you know, where this isn't <clears throat> just our capital city, which is bad and terrible. Um, but if it's potentially any of our cities, um, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're on it, and uh, I just it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens with with this. And I assume it would be appealed. I assume Salt Lake would stick with it. Is that is that what you would say, uh, Mayor Elect Mendenhall? 
if it, I would guess that no matter the the judge's decision, the other side will appeal. But yeah. I also think that the state feels a sense to some degree of urgency um, that I've heard, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard some narratives about the window of opportunity for Salt Lake City to create this uh, is closing as Reno and some other areas in the, in the Mountain West look at their own opportunities to act faster. So I, I think there's a couple of reasons that some people see, um, even if there, when, when an appeal, we should just assume an appeal will be lodged, that there's good reasons to work together to resolve it before it has to go through years and years of appellate court. So, question, Cameron or Roger, do you see this, um, the decision here having any impact on MIDA potentially? I was hoping you'd bring that yeah. up. I, al I almost leaned over to you and said, this would be a great time to bring up MIDA. Um, I'm glad you're about it. Right up, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> all I can do is laugh, but they come into a city <laughs> near you. So. <laughs> yes, well, can you take a moment and just, for people who, uh, who don't have the MIDA property in their backyard, just explain the issue that you've seen with the expansion up there? Yeah, MIDA was something that was created by the state initially to uh, create a military hotel for our service people. Great concept. It came out of a, a chalet that got closed down in Snow Basin during the Olympics, but it essentially created an entity, entity that can do exactly what cities do. Um, it's a state entity run by a board, I believe out of Davis County mostly, and they can uh, they sort of overlay a district and are able to tax uh, they have their own planning commissions, all those sort of things. Uh, Park City's been doing a dance with them for about 15 years in terms of they wanted to put a hotel in town. It started out, they wanted to put it on some of our open space and they didn't want to follow in zoning and that. And eventually they decided to go over to Wasatch County and, and work to deal with the new resort going over there, which had, um, it, it was a five acre property they were gonna build it on and it's now um, creeped into 4,000 acres and something that's the size of a small city that will be operated by MIDA, that the taxes don't go towards Wasatch County, MIDA controls their own building code. And uh, now they're trying to, to, they have the ability also to annex across county lines and such, pretty much do what they want. So we've been in ongoing negotiations with them, and I met with the Senator President recently, and um, they don't want to overdo MIDA because they like to do it in lots of places in the state, he told me. So they're trying to avoid conflict on our end, but it, it scares me and seems to be an escalation between first we started pointing them out and then we went inland for it. Now we've got this new tool called MIDA that can go to communities anywhere and for the benefit of the military purportedly and then on a side issue to the benefit of economic development statewide, they can go in and basically do a land grab. It's um, not much we can do about it. Who is the owner of the 4,000 acres? Uh, there are a variety of owners. They, they're partnering with a large company called Extel for part of it, but they've now partnered with Hideout. And um, uh, but is it is an exempt property now? Yeah, who who owns the the land and fee title? Uh, it's a. I mean, it's a lot. Is of it, different. Well, is it, I guess the better question is: a private property that they're regulating, or is it federally owned property? It it's uh, the bulk of it is private property. Okay, so this is the key, this is a key point. Some of us were standing on the bridge about yeah. this ten years ago. So th th this is a very key point, and then Randy House, I heard the word Sidla. Yeah, yes, yeah, right. more of an acronym. Yes, yeah. acronym. Um, the MIDA was established uh, in order to utilize currently underutilized federally owned land. It could not be taxed, used, or in right. any fashion. And it's all over the country. This federally un underutilized land is all over the country. And Utah MIDA was established, and the league did support it a decade or so ago. Um, and I think there were, there's a bit of buyer's remorse amongst many members of the league who were around when that decision was made. But nevertheless, there it was, it was supported so as to facilitate the development of underutilized federal land around Hill Air Force Base. It was completely voluntary for the shows of this. Correct. And as Mayor Beerman indicates, now MIDA is being used in Wasatch County to be the local government authority. I did that in air quotes for those of you on the phone. To be the local government authority over privately owned property rather than federally owned property, which is different than Mayor Niehaus's issue and Mayor Pike's issue 
and issue in other communities on state with SITLA, which is your school and institutional trust lands that are state state owned, uh, but are increasingly being used to facilitate other types of development independent of existing local governments, whether that is in the Spanish Valley in uh, San Juan County, just down the road from Moab, um, or it is, what's the name of your, is Sun something? Everything is Sun something. Sun River or, or um, <clears throat> um, Crimson Cliffs, something uh, like Desert that. Color. Desert Color, yeah, and it's it's on the right track. Because if they're not adhering to what would otherwise be land use code. Yeah. I mean, right now, they're cooperating, but they always have this, this little thing saying, yeah, we could just ignore you city and that's what scares the life out of me is is because Sitla is the largest property owner in our county yeah. Yeah. can I just add for the record um, so having because Grassville had dodged the bullet on the prison I mean we were one of three you know that were being considered for the state prison and then now with the inland port issue and Salt Lake um, I just wanted to say I appreciate the efforts of Salt Lake to make it so that uh, the impact on cities would not be as bad. I, I mean, I know we have to kind of be playing with the legislature to make things work somehow, but um, that's why our communities, I mean, we could see how we could have been impacted. If we were a bigger player like Salt Lake City, I think we would be able to, um, I guess, fight back a little bit easier. But anyway, I'm just saying that uh, I, I appreciate the efforts of Salt Lake. And then also, I was curious to see where Dan Dugan, he's mm -hmm. the one that yep. um, won the election against Charlie Luke. And he actually has publicly expressed his opposition to a lot of the characteristics of the inland port. So it was kind of good to know. I just wondered if he was on the opposite side of the issue, but it's good to know that he also felt the same way. Uh, it's, uh, he's very passionate. And Salt Lake City has, has taken the majority, they've done the majority of the work since that special session to date. But at some point in the soon, not too distant future, they'll be asking the league based on these principles to either join them or not. And so that's why I want to take the chance now to put all those issues out there for your consideration so you can see how they play off of MIDA and SIDLA and some of these bigger conversations mm -hmm. around development, uh, including even gravel pits, because some of the ideas that have been tossed out at the legislature to solve issues like the common mall, uh, so that one's for you, Brad, is your final. <laughs> hey, good. Huh? You're on camera, so we can see the uh, facial expression. Um, and and uh, Councilmember Martin Lowry from Draper, we had two of your new council members at our training on Saturday who both stayed with me afterward for almost an hour talking gravel pits. But we've heard the legislature say, well, what if we did something like MIDA for critical infrastructure projects or undesirable land uses? So you can see uh, the next steps of this, and I think the, the litigation will be an important cog in this overall. Effort. I just have one comment. So just, um, um, I wish that we had a board member from the Price area, because I've heard conflicting support about the Inland Port. We heard during the set, this past session, part of the reason why Charlie Luke went to bat for other cities, is we heard from a lot of communities off the Wasatch Front that they wanted the hub and spoke model to help facilitate development in rural Utah. Uh, it would be very helpful for, for you to facilitate some conversations with us and city leaders um, in Price and Castledale and elsewhere. And, and Mayor Christensen, same thing goes for you in, in your region. Uh, like we had heard from Beaver and Fillmore and others that they wanted to support the hub and spoke model. Um, up in northern Utah as well, we heard from Willard and Perry and Brigham City. So it would be helpful for us to yeah, to get that feedback as we prepare to respond to the potential amicus brief request on the session. Well, it might just mean a little more education too about the implications 
like Mayor Mayor um, uh, Mayor Corian's price. Mm -hmm. You might just need, you know, a little more information too. Well, and the key difference for Price versus Salt Lake is that Price would join the Albert Spoke voluntarily. So it's one thing for Price City say, yes, we're going to give up our property tax and our land use authority because we're going to voluntarily enter into this re relationship. Um, Mayor like men and all, this may this may be too soon. But was your choice voluntary in that salary? <laughs> I couldn't hear you very well, Cam. I I was being uh, I was being a smart aleck. Um, I was joking about the fact that you didn't have a choice in Salt Lake City to enter into the Inland Port Authority. You can say that. <laughs> 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 so, uh, will the amicus briefs on both these issues come before the board, do you think, in so the January? Process, so, the process you set out is once we, as staff, get a request, we convene the subgroup, which includes Mayor Silvestrini, Mayor Christensen, and Mayor Wilson Edwards. And then they make a recommendation, and then we notify the board. Um, you know, I'm simplifying it, but that's, that's the gist of it. Because of the politics around these issues, I wanted the three of them to be able to hear the dialogue now. And you know they may be politically rot enough that they'll give a recommendation on the legal side, and then we talk about it as a board of how we proceed. I just want to say too that Mayor Niehaus's comment on education. Yeah, it's it would be interesting to see what does it mean to be a hub and spoke kind of community. Um, you know, whenever we talk about the inland port and Salt Lake just down the freeway from us. We're always talking about our impact on our city, but what is it like having it in your community? So it would be good to know the ramifications. So I, I hope we do end up supporting Salt Lake on this, but I think it might be worth having a broader conversation with the league and our members on how we're going to address these various attempts by the state to create these special districts. And, and, and the tricky thing about this is you take things like a military hotel, who's opposed to that, or funding for education, who's opposed for that. Certainly the hub and spoke concept for rural communities, those are very appealing on the surface, but the fact that it's being done to communities as opposed to in collaboration goes against all of our fundamental principles. And it, I mean, it's the definition, what they're doing is the definition violating the Ripper Clause. So I think aside from this lawsuit, we need to have a broader policy and a broader discussion because it's my understanding the state really is looking for more of these tools and doing more of these tools and kind of trying to figure out how far they can push without really upsetting everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and we should be prepared. Yep, agreed. Well stated. Uh, maybe the addition I'd make to it is simply the education component of it, make sure you're taking this information back to your councils, back to your uh, fellow elected representatives, so we can kind of start that process of, mm -hmm. of education uh, when this uh, uh, obviously becomes, uh, again, uh, uh, in the news, hot and heavy, as if it's not all the time every week, it seems like, but, uh, but in January when it comes up, so. Mr. Chairman, just one final thought, if you're willing. Yes. I would hope is what I think I've heard people say, I would hope that we as officers and board members and staff would be aggressive in our support uh, of Salt Lake on this. And uh, whenever they need, they need it, I hope we would have those discussions and, and work with uh, uh, Mayor Mendenhall uh, as these things come to fruition. And, and obviously we, we collaborate with the state as well because this isn't going to go down easy with them either. But Anyway, I think it's very important, and, and as Cameron said, I agree. I, I've got a city in our county who I think would like to be uh, a, a spoke, you know, in terms of the inland court. court. And, and, and I'm, I'm thinking, well, at least, as you said, they have a choice, mm -hmm. and I may be really happy to let them do that because, um, frankly, my city would probably enjoy all the benefits um, but not have our land use authority taken away. And, and other things. So, so it's an interesting concept, but I think the key is it's got to be voluntary. And um, and I think the unintended consequences that you really referred to there um, are, are critical. And we've just got to make sure we go into all these things, eyes wide open, and, and avoid furthering the problems that come from this. Ours didn't come to fruition, but we had Mida working with Northrop Grumman to do their 
ground-based strategic deterrent offices there. And every time we talked to MIDA about what that might look like, the landscape changed. And so we got really nervous. Like, we don't know yep. what we're actually agreeing to and what we're not. And it seems like they held all the cards. And so we had to back away from that in a pretty big way. But I agree, it makes me nervous as well. In the uh, six-county area, in the past, uh, we've been supportive of the inland port concept and you know, I don't know how that's changed if it has but I'll get an update from the communities around us and, and uh, so I can have more input. Perfect. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Anything else, Cameron? Well, that's actually a perfect pivot to the National League of Cities, if that's all right, yep. President. As I mentioned a few months ago, um, the league directors around the country uh, nominated me to be on the, the NLC Board of Directors, which became official in November. Uh, Susan, Mike, and, and I were in San Antonio for the National League of Cities Conference, uh, and that's when I was officially elected to the board. Part of the reason that the other league directors nominated me is because in the two years I've been director, can't hear you. You start talking about two years you've been director, Cameron. <laughs> Anybody hear him yet? He just All right, we should be good. Now. There is no detour. He's going to have to help fund the bypass. Now <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're talking like a politician. <laughs> What's happened in the two years since you've been director? That's when you we got. Yeah, the two years since I became director, I became a dad. I uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> well, in the in the two years, I've been actively pushing NLC to help state leagues push back on state preemption. And as the one the example to illustrate this is on plastic bags. Even though we only have now three cities in the state with plastic bag bans, there have been 30-ish states that have had legislation to preempt cities from being able to, to impose those bans. Plastic bags is the obvious one that we've heard a lot here but I could give you a list of similar legislation that's happening all over the country. Small cell was one we dealt with here and we actually got a pretty favorable result. Uh, yes, we were preempted, but we were preempted on our terms. So I said to NLC, we need some sort of database or connection so that when small cell comes up in Utah, that when Rogers negotiating that bill on behalf of the league, he can call the other Rogers in other states and say what worked, what didn't, and share these best practices. So I'm pleased to announce that they're introducing in January for the first time this database type concept, and it's built on what Carson was building for us internally, which was a collection of all of these preemption bills and tactics that we've seen. They also in November introduced this document, Restoring City Rights in an Era of Preemption. Uh, this is the only hard copy I have, but it's on their website. And then I spoke on a panel with the authors of this report about what state preemption means at the local level and how we can collectively push back. I utilized the respect outcomes collaboration pillars, and I know of at least a handful of states that are planning to take our pillars and implement them at their state level. So kudos to the board. As you recall, this came out of our relationship with Penn of Powers a year ago, trying to redefine the concept of local control. Um, we are we are among the leaders in NLC in trying to drive this conversation about preemption forward. And it was cool to be on that panel. That Susan, did we ever link that the panel I was on to our website? Or is it, we will this week. 
Okay, that's right. We'll be spotlighting this Friday all of the NLC stuff around preemption um, and Friday facts before the holiday. With that being said, uh, I'll be on the board of directors for the next couple of years. And so I guess the one thing for you to know from a budget perspective is in the upcoming year's budget, we will need to adjust the travel costs a little bit so that I can participate in those, in those board meetings. But the timing is nice because two years from now, the NLC conference will be in Salt Lake. And so that will cut down on our travel costs because all, all, all 4,000 of them will be coming to us. You'll also see there is a link in the documents to the NLC presidential um, platform, the 2020 presidential platform. I've got my one hard copy here, but I was asked and was one of only two league directors in the country to be part of this 20 member task force to put together the NLC 2020 presidential platform. It was unveiled at the November conference as well. Uh, the, the document touches on four policies, but I wanna tell you what the four shared values were. Uh, when we initially started the conversation, it was all about policy ideas. We did a huge brainstorming session of all the different policy ideas. And I encouraged the group to take a step back and focus on values and principles first. And you'll notice that of the four, the four principles, first is respect. America's local leaders ask the president to respect the authority of local government. And the second principle is partnership. Now, so if that sounds like respect and collaboration, you're right, it does. Because we were able to basically took what we've done here and incorporated it on the national scale. The third value is inclusion. The fourth value is accountability. And then the four major policy ideas are building sustainable infrastructure, creating a skilled workforce, ending housing instability and homelessness, and reducing gun violence. Not all 20 members agreed with all four of these uh, policy principles, but these are the four that got the majority of the votes after an all-day retreat, and then the NLC membership endorsed it at, in November. So I wanted to report back to you about that effort so you knew what came out of those conversations. NLC is taking this document and they are actually flying in mayors who are unaffiliated, Democratic mayors who are unaffiliated, flying them into Iowa to do interviews in person with each of the Democratic candidates. And they're having uh, Republican mayors sit down with the president to hand deliver this document. I also recommended that this document also ought to be distributed to all federal candidates and not just the president. And uh, they liked that concept. They'd never done that before. The presidential platform had always just been for presidential candidates. So I bring this to you today, one, to report back to you, and second, to take your temperature if you want to endorse, these, endorse this document and share it with federal candidates in Utah, or if you want to just say, yep, good work, NLC, and focus our efforts, at least for now, on legislative advocacy and our gubernatorial outreach. Uh, which certainly is plenty to keep us busy as staff. So at the very least, I wanted to report back to you, but then also at that request from NLC, I'll bring it to you for your consideration. Any questions? Mayor? I'm happy with that endorsement. I was really pleased to see that they took a position on housing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just as I think of our state and um, that housing is located in Department of Workforce Services, and it's still, I think mean, there's just a lot of work that we need to do on housing in our state anyway. I was, I was pleased to see that and that it might inspire us to think a little more about housing in Utah. We're represented very well down there. Proud of uh, Cameron and his involvement there. And you can see that uh, what uh, the good things we're doing are making their way into other Places I had the chance to interview uh, mayors and council members on a podcast that Susan set up uh, from uh, Eugene, Oregon, uh, Arizona, uh, where Maryland, else? Maryland, Colorado, Alamosa, Colorado. Alamosa, Colorado. Colorado. Yeah. yeah, so different uh, areas of the of the nation. All when I asked them the question of what they're dealing with, very similar things to what we're dealing with, and so. Uh, so it is not to just germane to us, but um, is there any consideration of? Well, I think the, Mayor Niehaus said she'd be comfortable with it. I would too. I think we had to use them. Mm -hmm. You need a motion. That's what. Mm -hmm. Cameron yep, needs. we would if you wanted to endorse these, endorse the platform. The 
I'm entertaining motion. motion. Okay. A motion to endorse the NLC presidential platform to the presidential candidates in this year's race. Second. Mayor Niehaus, second. Any uh, discussion on the motion? Okay, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, perfect. Endorsement of that. Um, okay. Next, Cameron. Do you want to give an update on the editorial board visits? Yeah, I'll pass it off to Mayor Pike or Mayor Caldwell. Mayor Caldwell. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, have a go. No, I thought they were great. It was a, a great chance to kind of circle back and report on some of the housing conversations that we've had and, and the expectations that were placed on communities to address those. Uh, I think they were all pleasantly surprised. They didn't have a whole lot of pushback on, on any of that. Uh, the fact that, what was it, 74 of the 83 cities that applied to have met their requirements and the other eight are in line to do that in January. I think surprised everybody and raised some eyebrows and um, let them know that we take that very seriously. And I, I thought it was all well received. So we kind of had some tax conversations and a number of other things, but I thought we kept to our key pillars with respect outcomes and collaboration. And then regardless of what comes out, that will be the filter through which we try to work through to accomplish those things. So I, I thought that they, in, in fact, the dozen is at the end said we used to have a reporter for every county that could go to every city council meeting, the county meetings, and everything else. Now we've got one for 248 cities in Utah. So we need your help. So we went in saying we want to be a resource to you all. If you have questions you can't answer, let us go do the pick and shovel work to get you information. We know you're spread really thin. You're only getting information from one direction. It's not fair or balanced, let us help be a counterbalance to some of those things as, as it comes forward, or just an information resource for you. And I thought they all appreciated that. And I, I think that when I left, I felt like the door was wide open for that. So I appreciate it. I thought you guys were well organized and I thought they went really well. Yes. I thought it was interesting <clears throat> that the D News was pushing us on um, rent control mm -hmm. and forming a, a position on that, having discussion on it. I thought Cameron handled that very well because uh, they were like, we want, and it's, and it's you know, your, your good friend. Mm -hmm. who's, is he the managing editor? What's mm -hmm. it? Yeah. yeah, managing editor. Yeah, is it Doug? Doug Wilkes. Um. Yeah, and, and I thought he handled that well because, you know, that's a, that's a big discussion. Uh, but, uh, and then on, uh, was it, was it at the Desert News? I think it was, where they, basically were telling us, so are you going to eliminate single family mm -hmm. um, zoning? And I thought, wow. Yeah. And so we've had some fun, a couple fun text interchanges <laughs> over the course of that. And then of course, Jay Evanson uh, has a, uh, a piece <laughs> immediately, you know, followed our, our meeting there. So um, I don't think he zinged us really, except uh, we were mentioned. <coughs> And the irony of us talking about uh, Senate Bill 34, um, he mentioned that twice in his article about uh, how carpenters can't afford uh, have homes in the Wasatch Front in particular. But I, I thought it was interesting. I, I would rather be part of the discussion with that. So I think this is a good practice, uh, uh, Cameron and Mike's, since we'll probably be, I imagine, doing this every year or, or more often if need be. But better to be at the table with them because uh, otherwise that that uh, piece by uh, Jay Evanson could have been different. Mm -hmm. Could have been worse. Yep, I, agree. I didn't think it was great, but it could have been much worse. That's the overarching takeaway I got from both those meetings is the communication and that the league is open for communication. So in, in a de facto term with volunteered you for open communication as well. Uh, so, so just know that, but, uh, but like Mayor Caldwell said, one reporter for 248 cities and towns, we basically said anything you need to know about uh, legislation, especially when it comes up to this session, we will have an opinion and you can, you can reach out to us and, and contact us. And so. they were of the approach that they want us to be proactive in getting yeah, them. It's true. They can't yeah. chase all the leads. There's no way they can follow up on that. So if we Katie, give them information, right? they'll take it. Yeah. Katie, Katie Taylor. I mean, I pitched an idea to her on the way out. I, I think that's good to know. Mayor, it's good mm -hmm. to know that they're open to us contacting them mm -hmm. too. So. 
somebody referred to Spanish Fork as a little city. Was it in one of those meetings? Yeah, or it, was, I, it was Pam Perlick, but she was quoted in oh, yeah. the article about even a even a little city like Spanish Fork is is planning for housing. We have a Chili's now. We're getting so big, some people have two homes in our city. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How dumb is that? <laughs> We're still little. Are you still little? Okay. We have an east side and a west side in Spanish Fork, so. We're you do have a Miss Utah. And we have Miss Utah, who is in the top five right now for Miss America uh, as far as, I can't remember what they call it now, but the cause, like um, her, her platform yeah. or something. I can't remember, but she's in the top Miss five. Utah. So Thursday, yes, you're on Miss Spanish Fork, <laughs> who is Miss Utah, who is competing for Miss America. Who is a Talbot. Who is a Talbot, Ooh. that's true. Uh, is, who is a Talbot. And she is, uh, she's very good. Yes, yeah, she's good. very well spoken. Right. Little city, little city that has yes, Miss, right. competing for Miss America. Yeah, <laughs> come on. <laughs> respect. Okay. Kevin, then the LPC voting, this was a request that came from the board at the last meeting. Carson, will take one minute, give an update on our outreach here. Yeah, so just really briefly, uh, per the board's request, we started looking into some different options. Um, we think there we're still a ways out from being able to find the perfect program to do this. The LPC bylaws authorize remote voting in specific circumstances, specifically that voting members have to be publicly identified. So if you cast a vote, you have to have some authentication mechanism. And that's been kind of the challenge. There's two general software platforms that are available. There's the sort of online polling that we use at conferences and you might see. And then there's um, more formal electronic voting systems. And the challenge is that the electronic, the formal electronic voting systems have good authentication systems but they're not easy to change on the fly, which we would need to do for an LPC meeting. Say we're taking a vote on amending a position or um, if we were reversing our position in the same meeting. So we need something that's easy to change on the fly, like an online polling platform, but with the same authentication measures. There's one program that looks like it might have that potential and it's about $200 a month, which is a little bit maybe on the costlier end and we're happy to keep looking into this. Um, We'll keep exploring it regardless because there's there's room for improvement in our current online voting system. But just a quick update, we're we're in the process of examining it and there's a couple little tech hurdles that we have to get over, but I think they're they're manageable. Any questions? I just have a comment. Yeah. Having been a voter on the line. Yeah. Um on the we, line. <laughs> on the line. <laughs> it's my birthday, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going but um, just that um, I noticed that I can identify, I, it's not like authenticated, but I don't know if, if there would be a way if someone's um, going to participate um, uh, in LPC online that there could be a quick uh, like conversation to verify as opposed to paying for um, a bigger software because then when you call for a vote, anybody that's online would be then on a device, which then they could vote in in public. And then what that would mean is that I couldn't sit with other friends in my office that we, well, I could, but we'd all have to be on a separate machine. Yeah. So that's that's just a, an alternative suggestion because I've seen, you know, I voted that way and I've seen other people that vote that way. I What I don't get to see is what's happening live, but... Yeah. And my, my perfect system would be some kind of web app that everybody could have on their phone pulled up so you don't actually have to download the app, you just log into the web app. And then it, we would be able to, to determine if you're actually a voter or not because that's one of the challenges with Zoom is even though we ask people to sign in uh, or sign in with their names, a lot of people still have like iPad 3 or something like that, which is really difficult for us to determine if they're an actual voting member or not. So we need to find some solution and. Um, if there's any way that we could have individual, and maybe even if it's not password protected, but so that we know that whoever voting is actually a, a voting member for the bylaws. Um, so that's our, that's what, like, what we're hoping to get to. So that if you're all sitting in a room watching on one Zoom broadcast, you can all vote individually and not either try to vote as Moab City, for example, or yeah. So that's the, that's the, the trick and how we actually manage that logistically. 
Well, it's worth um, nailing it just so that we can continue to have a little participation. Carson, what's the name of the program you're looking at? So I think the best one is called the computer just turned out. So I was looking at a couple. The best, the one that I think fits the boxes right now is called Meeting Pulse. There's a couple other ones that um, might perform the same functionality, but either have a per user pay structure or a per event pay structure, which we'd like to have a fixed cost system so that we don't have to pay more depending on who's participating in an LPC meeting or however many LPCs we have, or if we decide to use it for um, if we have these for conferences as well. So that's the one I think currently fits all these boxes the best. And again, we'll keep looking into it because maybe there's some, some smaller vendors who don't have as much of a one presence to develop this specific niche product. But yeah, that's kind of the trick. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Carson. Appreciate all you do for LPC and all of our meetings. Yeah. It, uh, um, just one more comment, though. Sometimes yeah. internet is spotty in the world. Yeah. So whatever system is um, developed. Um, we usually keep our telephones pretty active. So um, maybe just make sure there's some redundancy so that if somebody can't connect online for whatever reason, they could probably still call in and just like identify, I don't know. And there may be some ADA issues that we're trying to still explore so that if somebody can't use a website, for example, or can't use a phone, that there's still some Needs for them to cast a vote or some alternative system. I mean, even at like Capital, Wi Fi can be pretty spotty some days if there's a rally or something. So it's just finding something that, that kind of balances that well enough. Again, the, the system right now is not ideal, so we'd like to find some some better system, but yeah, it's just balancing those, those different needs. Perfect. Perfect. To that end, I also want to introduce another member of our team over the past few months which is uh, Rusty Facer. We brought Rusty in as, as an intern over the this semester to help us take a critical eye at our sponsorship program. And you'll see a draft that's in the, that's in the document. Uh, we do not need you to take an official position or make a motion on the sponsorship program. We just wanted to make you just generally aware of the direction we're going in. And Rusty has done tremendous work looking at how other leagues structure their sponsorship programs other organizations in Utah structure their sponsorship programs. Uh, All of his great, great work and outreach. Uh, we don't need a, we don't need a motion on this. But if you have any thoughts or ideas, let Rusty know or let let us as an administrative team know. We are sending a letter to sponsors this week, informing them of of uh, this draft change. And then, when we get our new events and strategic person, strategic partnerships person hired, that's the position you authorized um, in the last board meeting. Uh, when we get that person hired, then that person will be responsible for the for the implementation. So, any uh, thoughts or questions on the sponsorship stuff? Wanted to say, having been part of the phone meeting about it, just really appreciated the work of the staff. I know you look a lot at the different options, and the nice thing was just um, you know just thinking outside the box and just adding some value to sponsors, but also keeping the spirit of UPLCT so we're not, so we are still maintaining our integrity. So thank you for all your work. I feel really good about this program. You know, Cameron, last month you asked me about other uh, conferences I've attended mm -hmm. where they're, uh, they get recognition on when they sponsor a luncheon or whatever. And I thought back at all the UASD 
conference as I went to it, unlike every meal, the sponsor got up uh, right, right before the meal to, to accept thanks and uh, to say why they're there. So they didn't get a chance to, to mention themselves directly at each of those events they sponsored. And it didn't feel, no. I, I won't use the, the, the NASCAR word because uh, you were going to wear your NASCAR jacket to show me. I know, that, but it's too cold. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't feel over-commercialized. <laughs> yeah. No, it didn't feel over-commercialized at all. And in fact, some of them, you know, they sponsored a speaker and the speaker sold books afterwards. Mm -hmm. It still didn't feel bad. Um, and just a real quick comment, too. Um, I talked to one of the vendors, and they really appreciate actually being able to talk to other vendors, so I don't know if we do a good job of having a separate space for them as well because they gained a lot of information from other vendors so anyways I, and it's just a side note but it was a good feedback they had been it hardly uh, as a vendor I think that'll uh, alleviate itself in the salt panels too that we'll have a space for vendors yeah. yeah I think that will and we've talked about doing receptions and other ways to try to have more of that dialogue so that's, but I appreciate that comment so if other ideas come to mind let us know and Rusty thank you again for your fantastic work over the last few months. Um, to that end then, uh, President, we have prepared uh, goals and objectives for 2020. Uh, we've broken them down by de department within the city, or hell, within the league. Uh, John Park uh, was unable to come today because he had a, just a medical procedure he needed to do. But I've prepared these with him based on feedback from staff after the strategic retreat we had in October and follow-up feedback from you as, as board members. What we'd like is for you to approve these goals if they reflect what you want to see out of the organization in 2020. Uh, some are measurable, some are not. Uh, we were going back and forth on how to create measurables and, and in some cases, the metrics won't be available for another year, in part because the move to the South Palace. You'll see that there are goals around training uh, and trying to use the annual convention at the South Palace as a benchmark, but then we can build goals going forward from there. Uh, finance and administration, uh, two goals there. There are three goals, and what we've just termed as cross-departmental, uh, which is just membership engagement. We have a small staff, as you know, we don't have a director of membership per se, but we all have a role in engaging with the members. So the idea here is through all of the different departments within the league, and these would be the, the goals to expand that membership engagement. I, I guess I should also clarify, when I say the training department, that would be like Meg Ryan, who's our land use manager, uh, John Park, who's on staff as training, and even to a degree, other members on staff will all have a say in how we plan our trainings. Susan's role historically was Director of Communications and Training, and we've been readjusting that so that her focus can primarily be on communication and help on the ledge team side. Um, if we are able to hire the strategic and event, um, event and strategic partnership coordinator, that person would be helping to meet those goals on the logistics side on training. Um, the fourth department is communication, so this would be Susan and her team, and then the advocacy side would be the ledge team, including the, the future uh, government relations director. We have interviewed a number of candidates for both of those jobs, both the event strategic partnership coordinator and the director of government relations, and hoping to be able to make offers soon, so that come January, we are fully staffed before the session arrives. So, you know, President, I'm open to feedback about these goals. If people have potential suggestions or changes to the goals or to the listed objectives therein, and then we'd, we'd take a motion to adopt them for 2020. Everybody had a chance to look over this summary? Just a general comment, Mr. Chairman, I read through them this morning since I was up at five from there. Um, but I think it's fantastic. I appreciate the, um, uh, the attention in all these areas, and the, I think they're I think they're fantastic. I don't have any any specific comments, but other than just to say it, I think it's a great way to start a, uh, an important, every year's important, but a, an important year for us. Mm -hmm. 
I'll just add to that. It'll be good, like Cameron mentioned, to, to go uh, a year from now and look over these and, and, uh, and see what uh, accomplishments uh, of, of these goals uh, we, we got done. But uh, it, it, a lot of them are staff specific, but you can, if you read through them, you'll see uh, a lot of these identify engaging more with the officers uh, of the league as well. So, so uh, again, word of uh, warning and invitation, I guess, that we're, we're, we're up to, uh, you know, a few weeks until we're into the session again. And uh, you will be just as uh, when you were crazy enough to submit your name to, to be a member of the board, you will be engaged, uh, uh, especially as we get busy during the legislative session for, for outreach, your opinion, your insights, and, and, and really what you do great uh, already is representing your, your constituents. So, so be prepared. Uh, a lot of these goals depend on us being engaged and, uh, and helping lift, uh, lift at the lead to, to accomplish these goals. So. With that, I'd entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to accept. Here. A second. And a second. Uh, thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Perfect. Great. Thank you, Cameron. Thanks for the good work on that. Perfect. Well, thank you. And, and just so you know how we plan to build 2020, obviously we kicked the year off with a bang with the session. And then in the spring is when you set the dues and you set the budget for the following year. So what we're what we're trying to figure out is the best time and avoid to put these goals forward because then the board changes in September. So our thought process is to do a progress report in the spring. So that way as you're setting the budget for the following year, uh, we can give you recommendations about how to meet goals if that requires changes in the budget. And then through the summer, well, that's when we hope to implement a lot of the advocacy, the proactive advocacy ideas that we've set forward and discussed with you. And then when a new board comes in in September, we sit down with them like we did this year, have that treat in October, um, and give them an update of what goals have been set, get their feedback, and then and then set it set the goals again for 2021. So it's almost at. We'll, we'll lay out a calendar of all those checkpoints um, when we get to January. The last thing with, within the staff goals is that we had, we've talked about the outreach um, in the gubernatorial election in 2020. What we've discussed with the officers is to uh, invite each of the major gubernatorial candidates to do an in-person video interview with President Mendenhall about five key issues to local government. And then Susan would produce this video series, and so I'd say week one would be on topic X, and week two would be on topic Y, but all of them would be answering the same question, having a conversation with Mike in that, in that same video. Susan, is that a good explanation of it? We, as staff, brainstormed 10 questions for you that we sent in the survey. Nick, do you know how many people responded to that survey? I do not, but I can look it up as you're talking. Yeah, but we're, we'll send it back out again after the board meeting. What we need from you is just to highlight your top five priorities out of those 10 questions. Then we'll put together the script for Mike. That way, when Mike talks to these gubernatorial candidates, he can say these questions came directly from the board of directors, um, and we'll, we'll rank them accordingly. So, how many have filled it out so far? Okay. Um, but that so that link is in your packet, and you just put your top priority. Just move your top five up to the top. Um, there is not, but we can add one. I don't think if you want to rank yours, right? You just five up here. Yeah. Cameron, I don't know how many other um, members have had an opportunity or board members to have conversations with the. Uh, gubernatorial um, <clears throat> uh, candidates, but, <coughs> me, but in Davis County, I know we had it with COG on one with Lieutenant Governor Cox, and there's another one coming uh, that will be coming with uh, uh, Mr. Huntsman. They've been, they've been uh, good. 
it's been good to hear what they say. And we've been having it as a more lax conversation where you can ask questions and have something like that. that has been good. So I would encourage if you can to a now and then in your individual cities and stuff. I'm sure they would like to come by in all city. <laughs> they might buy. Yeah. yeah, invite them to Chile. Yeah. Yes. Have an opportunity to with you. Good it. luck, though, if you're a little more remote. It, that attention must feel real nice. <laughs> I noticed he has parked his bus, big green bus, right there on Highway 6 and I-15. So I think he's counting that that's visible to Moab because that's where we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but it is good to be informed a little bit more. Would it be valuable, Mayor, once we get these qu these five questions finalized, to share these questions with members, and then then the members at least know what questions the board will be asking? Okay. Great. So that's that's the uh, extent on the advocacy engagement and outreach. Uh, it brings back to board vacancies. Great. You can do that, or I can do that. Yeah, uh, Mayor Ramsey couldn't uh, make it up here today. She let us know. Uh, she's got some some previous commitments. Uh, I did want to uh, board vacancies of uh, Council Member Graham. Uh, that so this will be his last meeting as a, as a, a member of our uh, of our board. Um, and so, in that vein, I wanted to give him a, about forty five minutes to an hour to uh, to give <laughs> uh, us some wisdom. Well, I, I uh, thank you. I don't know if that'll be enough time, but I'll do my best. Um, <laughs> I, I just I, I just want to say thank you. Um, so some of you may know um, I, I chose not to run um, for election um, because I had um, given some little advance notice that I would be um, called on a mission to serve as a mission president for the LDS Church. And so next July I will be doing that, and that's the reason I didn't run, not because I didn't like this experience or or anything like that, but because of those things. So um, I just. Um, I just want to say thank you. I, I feel like I should be sitting in Mayor Christensen's chair in his Lazy Boy with the sun setting behind me. Uh -huh. uh, as my my time with with the uh, with the league kind of comes to an end, but I, I want to say thank you that I first for taking a chance on me, and for all of you who have been so kind to kind of to coach me, to mentor me, and help me be a better representative for Holiday, and to learn a lot about what was going on in the state. I've come away as a big fan of the league and of those of you who, um, who, who run it and, um, and make such a difference. So I just, I, I'm a big fan. I appreciate the opportunity to, to rub shoulders with you, and I look forward to, to being back and trying to find a way to, to be involved in some way when I'm back in, uh, in three years. So thank you. Do we know where you're going? I uh, received an email on Friday saying I'd find out this week. All right. All right. Cool. I'll well, keep us All right. Yeah. Congrats. Thank you. Thanks, Brett. Appreciate your service to the league uh, and uh, uh, both uh, on the hill and off the hill. You've been a great asset to the board. So we're going. We're going to miss you. Thank you. With and, that, and, and to that end, just so everyone's aware of the process, uh, our bylaws are actually rather vague. It just refer or defers the authority to the officers to fill vacancies. And so since. Brett's on the city council until the end of December. We have not yet posted it. Uh, you next meet on local officials day on January 29th. So the first week of January, we'll send out information to the members asking for um, applicants. Once we get applicants, then the five officers and I will review those and bring forward a candidate for your approval to join the board to fill the remainder of Brett's term uh, when we meet on local officials day on January 29th. So you're aware, I did meet with uh, Brett as well as his mayor, Mary Dolly of, of Holiday, and they have a couple of people in Holiday who are interested in running. Uh, I've not heard from others at this point, but I, I assume that I will once we make that po or once we do that post right after the holidays. So often the officers will make that determination, but if you know of other people who are interested, um, let us know. Okay, perfect. Anything else? needs to come before this body before we break to our next league meeting. Okay. Move to adjourn. All, right. <laughs> All in favor, say aye. 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 aye.